Test, test. Oh, okay, we're live. So, uh, I don't think any more people are going to show up. So, we might as well hug, go ahead and get started. And that'll give me a few extra minutes. Uh, so, we're starting about five minutes early so that I can use all the time I can get. And actually, the session after this is lunch. So, if I can go a few minutes over into lunch, is that okay with you guys? Yeah. All right, cool. Welcome to Malware Hunting with the SysInternals Tools. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, that's much better. How's TechEd going? Good? Just okay? It's, I heard it sucks. That's not good. <laughs> oh, the internet sucks. Okay. That's better. So let's talk about what we're doing here today. This quotation, which I had up uh, while you were floating in, is one from a Google research paper from last year. Uh, well, it's actually a, this one's a university paper. There's actually a different one that's a uh, Google paper that has basically the same statistic. And this statistic right here is, sa basically states that these researchers looked across the web, identified malware using heuristics, and then found that less than 40% of the malware that they identified when they went and actually verified that the heuristics were accurate, was detected as malware by antivirus engines, by the top four antivirus engines on the market. And so this is a, a pretty representative statistic. In fact, I think even 40% in many cases is high for malware's detection rates. This is what I call zero-day malware, malware that, does, that flies under the radar. And in fact, the situation's gotten so grim with the rate of malware proliferating, evolving, morphing, that that has prompted one of the number one antivirus vendors in the world to come out and publicly state that antivirus is dead. That's a pretty shocking thing because some of us have been saying antivirus is dead for a while. In fact, well, actually, when I read, when I read this thing, uh, I heard, I'm not dead yet. And then <laughs> and I was like, where's that coming from? And it was coming from Microsoft anti-malware sitting on my computer. Actually, anti-malware does play a role. It's good for cleaning off the stuff that's there. But obviously, a lot of stuff is slipping through. And, I, and here's another headline out. You've been living in a different world. So. The reason that we're here is because there's a lot of malware that floats, that gets onto people's machines that anti-malware doesn't stop and then doesn't detect, and that causes us problems. How many people have been infected with malware in the last, no, wait, in the last month, in the last week? A few people in the last week. Uh, today, anybody have malware on their laptop today, here in the room? Nobody? There's always one person that comes to this session because they've got malware and they want to know how to clean it off. <laughs> I guess you're not admitting it, whoever you are. So let's talk about the, the goals of this presentation today. Uh, obviously, I'm going to focus on the SysInternals tools to show you how you can analyze, understand the impact of malware is having on a system, and then clean it off the system. And I want to make it clear that this is not professional an malware analysis. The professional malware analysts, their job goes a lot deeper than what I'm going to be showing today because their job is to really fully understand exactly what the malware is doing, the, the full extent of, it, of its purpose, whether it's who's behind the malware, understanding how it's infecting the system because there might be new infection techniques going on, how it's hiding on the system. Our goal today is just simply to figure out how to get that crap off your system or figure out what it's doing on your system. The fact is, though, that using the techniques that I'm going to show you today, it's pretty effective against the bulk of malware out, out there on the market today. And I'm going to show you a bunch of real-world examples of cleaning malware off systems and understanding advanced malware the current, current, with current samples off of systems. And what's really rewarding to me is that a lot of times professional malware researchers, I'll go read their reports and they'll show SysInternals tools as part of their research. It's great for them as kind of a first wave reconnaissance to understand what malware is doing and then they can dive deeper with more sophisticated tools. Even if you don't understand how to clean the malware, it's useful to look at what the impact of the malware is so you can understand if this thing is spreading throughout your network and what its impact is. 
This recipe for cleaning malware I came up with back in 2005. If you've been to this session before, you know this is the same recipe that I've been talking about for a while. And this recipe, you can see it has a number of steps, starting with disconnect from the network. When I came up with this recipe back in 2004, 2005, this step was absolutely essential to even get a, a grip on the system to be able to clean malware off it, because back then there was a scourge of adware and spyware where you would get infected by one piece of it, and then it would start dragging more stuff down on your computer. And I'd be sitting there trying to clean malware off a system, and as I was cleaning it, more stuff would just get piled on, and it was like, I can't get in ahead of this. And so I'd disconnect from the network, and that would stop malware from getting on the machine. Another very important reason to disconnect from the network is that you stop the exfiltration of data at that point. If somebody's actually in your network sucking data off your PC or off your corporate network, this will stop that. There are some downsides to disconnecting from the network that I'll cover as we go along. Second step is identify the malicious processes and drivers. This is kind of the recon phase, looking through your system to find out what might be suspicious. Once you've identified something that's suspicious with enough degree of confidence, at that point you terminate those processes. And the reason that you do this before moving on to the next phases of cleaning the thing off is because a lot of malware has defense measures, active defense, where when you try to clean the malware off the system, it protects itself. It'll put itself back into registry keys. It'll restore its files and uses other techniques like that. So terminating the malware at least gets the active defenses out of the way while you, so allowing you to proceed to the next steps of cleaning. And then you need to figure out how does this thing activate? Most malware activates itself every time you log onto the system or boot the system or run a particular, like IE or another process. So your job is to figure out how it's activating so you can terminate those activation points and clean those off. And then finally, as an extra measure, you go delete the malware itself. Cleaning the auto starts theoretically is enough to clean the malware off the system, but just to be safe, go delete the malware off the, the malware files and executables you found, because if nothing else, if you missed something as far as an auto start, you might cripple the malware and prevent it from reactivating if you delete some of its key files. This is like... Uh, the old shampoo commercials, you need to rinse, lather, rinse, repeat on this one because you might have missed something even after going through these steps. So go back, look for the original symptoms after you've gone through this, reboot your machine, make sure that the system appears clean, and then you can move on. And by the way, speaking of keep making the system clean in this way, there's schools of thought around the risk of cleaning malware off a machine when you don't really know what it is. There's one camp that says, hey, you find your machine infected, just flatten it because that's the safe thing to do. And then there's another camp, which I tend to be in, which is if you have enough confidence that you understand what the malware is doing, clean it off, and then that way you don't have to go through the pain and hassle of reimaging your machine. This is really an important consideration in corporate environments where flattening your whole network, especially in cases where the malware has gotten into very sensitive places and servers, Flattening those things could cause your business downtime of days or weeks. And even Microsoft Consulting Services will come in and say, we feel like we understand the malware, we've got a high degree of confidence. Ask the customer, what do you want to do? Would you rather flatten and really be sure? And even then you can't really be sure because there might be malware floating around endpoints that you're not aware of and you get reinfected. But then make the call. And so that's why I talk about cleaning. So let's talk about how you identify malware processes. There's a few things that you look for as you scan the system looking for suspicious processes. And these characteristics are ones that I've come up, I came up with like 10 years ago, and they're still valid today, fortunately. And these are processes, images that have no icon, that have no company name or description in their version information, that they say that they're from Microsoft, but they're not digitally signed. They live in the Windows directory, and this is a relatively new one, uh, as of UAC and, Windows, uh, and Vista, because a lot of malware these days doesn't need administrative rights, and so they'll stick themselves in the user profile rather than in the Windows directory. So that's another suspicious place to look. They're packed, and I'll talk about what packed means in a little bit. If you look inside the images, you might find interesting text that reveals the fact that they're malicious, like pointers, like URLs to suspicious places on the web. They've got open TCP, P, TCP IP endpoints because they're talking out to the web, beaconing or sending data out, or they host suspicious DLLs, DLLs or services. So it might be a process that is actually hosting some malware inside of it. How do you 
look for this kind of stuff. How many people use Task Manager to look for malware? Let's see you raise your hands. That's really, really sad. <laughs> That's like walking into a, a, a dark room with a blindfold on and looking for the furniture. What you should be using is what? Process, I didn't hear that loudly enough. Process Explorer, right, Process Explorer. Process Explorer, of course, the first system internals tool we're gonna talk about. How many people have used Process Explorer? How many people have not used Process Explorer? Really, you're gonna raise your hand? <laughs> so Process Explorer has a lot of troubleshooting capabilities, like you can look for DLL versioning problems, you can look for locked files, you can look for hand, uh, memory leaks. What I'm going to be focusing on in this session is just the malware uh, hunting capabilities that I've added and that act, it generally has just by nature of being a system tool. In the case of the Unexplain, that's where I go into the other type of features that it has. So let's p p pull up Process Explorer and just take a quick tour for the one guy that's never run it before and take a look at what we see here in the process view. The process view, of course, shows you the list of processes running on the system. The view is different than task manager. As you can see, it's got this nested view, and that re represents the parent-child relationship of the processes. The place where one of the places you can see this most clearly is in this part of the tree, which is Explorer. Explorer is the shell by default. It's what Windows runs when you log into the system because it's specified in a certain registry key that you'll see in a little bit. And Whenever you launch something in your lo interactive session, when you do it, it gets launched from Explorer. So everything under Explorer, nested within it, is a child of Explorer, part of your interactive logon session. There's cases when there's processes that are left justified, and they're really, or those are ones with, that have no parent process. The parent process is terminated. This would happen if, for example, you launched something from Explorer, like a command prompt, launched something from that, and then terminated the command prompt, so you've just left that process a sad little orphan, and it'll show up left justified in the tree. For each process, you see the process name, you see CPU memory statistics, you see a description and company name, that's what I was referring to in, when looking for suspicious processes. Processes that are malicious oftentimes don't have a company name or a description, one or the other, and the reason that they don't is because Task Manager for a long time never showed you either, even Ta or by default, and Task Manager doesn't show you, the, it's either the description or the company name, even today, whereas MS Config, the uh, auto start viewer that's built into Windows, shows you description or company name, one or the other, and so people even that are mildly sophisticated in using those kinds of tools, the malware would just blend into the system. It wouldn't show up as, as uh, missing something like it would here in this view that shows you both. So you can see I don't have any processes that are missing company name or description except for the system and system idle process, those are system processes. The other things that you can see are here some uh, tools like the window finder up here in the toolbar. This is useful for looking for who owns a pop-up. If malware is popping up windows on you, which not, more, more and more rarely these days does that happen, most malware these days is, just takes over the browser completely or is sitting there in the background being a botnet on your system, but if it is, use the window finder. And so, for example, if I launch this applet right here, it's really hard for us to see who owns that process just by looking at the, win uh, at the process list. There's nothing in this list that says time in it, even though that's the time date dialog. But if I move the window finder over it, it takes me to this run DLL32 process. So that is the process that owns that particular window, which you identified with the Windows finder. There's also a search online capability, one that's actually been taken back into Task Manager in Windows. So if you right click on something, it'll do a search using your favorite search engine. So you can Google it using Bing or Bing it using Google, whichever one you want. And here you can see that I've just done a search for Explorer and it finds some information. Many of these like uh, kind of malware directed sites that uh, t tell you information about images, but it's really a ploy to just serve you ads. Unfortunately, that's most of the junk that you're going to find with Search Online these days. And in fact, Search Online's become a little less yes, useful over time because a lot of malware uses randomly generated names, sometimes even very cleverly by taking strings off the paths that are on your system and concatenating them together so it kind of looks legitimate. And so you'll, it'll blend in with the noise of Windows just by 
having pieces of real names of files and, pro and directories, and yet it won't show up in a search online because it's been randomly generated off your particular computer. So search online isn't that useful anymore. One of the things that you'll notice as you use Process Explorer is that there's a various colors in the display. And let's talk about some of the colors here, like the pink colors. Uh, if you've been to my case of the explain, you know what pink represents? What's it represent? Girl, girl processes, correct? Yeah, girl processes. And the blue are the boy processes. I bet you didn't know that, that they were, had gender, but they do. No, I'm just kidding, of course. The pink processes are service hosting processes. They're ones that ho host Windows services, these background tasks that execute no matter who's logged in generally. And then the blue processes are ones running as you. So that's why you can see down here in the Explorer part of the tree, everything is blue down here because that's all log launched as me. There's some other pro colors here, like you can see this cyan color. That is a modern, or I mean, sorry, a met, I mean, a, a, a app, a Windows 8 app store, app modern universal, no, uh, whatever, you know what it is. And that, uh, you can see the Explorer knows how to be one of these dual kind of things. If I scroll up here, I've got some other ones up here that are running as over on that other world that exists in Windows 8. And then there's some other colors that aren't shown here because I don't have any processes that are highlighted by that. There's a purple one down here, these two purple processes, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But let's talk about refresh highlighting, and that is refresh highlighting is this ability of Process Explorer to show you new processes, like there's a green right there when I launch Notepad, and if I terminate Notepad, it'll turn red, and that shows you processes as they're coming and going. So if you see red and green, that means processes are being launched and terminated. The default refresh duration is only one second, but you can change that up here in the options. So you can say difference highlight duration and set this up to nine seconds. The problem with this, and I just set it to nine, is that even there, processes can be so short-lived that they don't show up in Process Explorer's refresh. So if I do an IP config, IP config never showed up as green or red there because it was short-lived enough, even with all the junk that it spits out these days, that it lived between refresh intervals. And so Process Explorer never saw it. So the question is, how do you catch processes that are short-lived like that? And I'll answer that in a little bit when we go to another tool. So the blue processes, uh, the, the purple processes that I was mentioning before, those are what are called packed processes. Packed processes are ones that have, meet certain heuristics that a lot of image packers, like UPX, if you're familiar with that, use to compress images or encrypt them. And the reason that I highlight them in purple is because a lot of malware uses compressors or encryptors to obfuscate the contents of the image itself, unrolling the contents into memory when they launch. And so when you look at the file on disk, you don't see anything but garbage. When the thing on launches into memory, then that's where the malware gets active. And so there's legitimate software that'll show up with that heuristic sometimes, but most of the time, that represents a strong signal that you've got a piece of malware. And I do have an interesting process, like we saw before, sitting here, in fact, two copies of it, a process called WinHost. And this WinHost advertises itself as the Windows Host Support Service from Microsoft Corporation. Already, we've got a few signals that this might be malware. First of all, it's showing up in the Windows directory. So it's showing up in the Windows directory as opposed to a program files directory, but it's launched as part of underneath Explorer. And second, it is showing up with a packed image process. So it, it's potentially packed. If I double click on this and we go to the, this tab, it also tells me here that its image is probably packed. This is the process properties. The other things you'll see here are command lines, current directories, auto start locations, which I'll talk about in a, in a little bit. And then there's tool tips. The tool tips that you've seen floating, uh, popping up as I've moved the cursor around this part of the tree show you more information, some of it that you saw in that image properties dialog, like the command line, like the path, and for processes that are hosting components, so their job in life is just to host things, just as a, a container, you'll see what's hosted inside of it. The most common example on a Windows system is this uh, service host process, which is 
as the name implies, just hosts Windows services. And so if you hover the tooltip over one of these, like this one right here, you can see that this service host is hosting this Windows image acquisition service. We saw that run DLL32 down here. And the way that that gets launched, we can see through the tooltip here, because run DLL32 launched with this command line to execute timedate.cpl. Run DLL32 is another hosting type process, very commonly used by malware to hide itself. And so you can see what is inside of run DLL32 by hovering over it with the tooltip. Process Explorer even decodes information about that DLL so you don't have to go into the, the DLL view, which we'll see in a second, to see that this is the time date CPL for Microsoft Corporation. Now, let's take a deeper look at that win host because that thing shows up as suspicious. And how can we get some more signals as to whether that thing really is malicious or not? One is to check the digital signature on it. Almost all Microsoft software is digitally signed these days. In fact, it's a rule that you can't go out of Microsoft published software without it being digitally signed. So how can we check if these things are digitally signed? There's a few ways. One is to double click and click on this verify button right here. When you click on the verify button, it'll tell me up here information about the signature. And in this case, it says no signature was present in the subject. So even though it says it's from Microsoft, there's no valid digital signature on it. It means that it's no signature at all, or the signature is expired, or the signature has been revoked because it was a, 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 a falsely created certificate. If we take a look at Explorer and we do a verify, you see that in this case, it is digitally signed. But going through one by one, when you've got a system that's infect potentially infected with malware like this is kind of tedious. So there's an easier way to do this, and that is to add the verified signers column here in the, in the column picker, and then go to the options and say, verify image signatures. And that's what I'm going to do. I just check that. And now what's happening is Process Explorer in the background is going to go and verify all the signatures. If you sort by that, you can see that there's third parties, tools that are signed. And then down here at the bottom, you can see that there's one, uh, here's a, a legitimate piece of software that's not signed from uh, it's a screen grab tool that I use. Some of my system internals tools that I've done builds on that are, I haven't published yet, they're not digitally signed. And then finally, sure enough, we see that this WinHost isn't signed. By the way, WinHost, if you haven't figured it out, is a little piece of fake malware that I created just for demonstration purposes. And I was like, huh, what's a good name for a piece of fake malware? I'll just come up with WinHost. But what really pisses me off is if you do a search online, there's like real malware that's copied it now. <laughs> Load the Lolo Jack hijacker. So somebody's uh, using my process name without my permission, which is really annoying. Uh, I mentioned one of the uh, downsides of uh, disconnecting from the network is that you, that you, uh, the malware can't, or the pluses is that the malware can't talk out to the network. One of the downsides is if the digital signature's been revoked and Process Explorer to do the vi image verification, the signature verification needs to go to the web to check the certificate revocation list servers. If you're disconnected from the network, it's not going to be able to pull that information down. And so you might end up seeing something's legitimately signed if you're disconnected from the network even though the certificate has been revoked. So that's one potential downside. This is new. How many people knew that I've integrated malware scanning into Process Explorer? So a lot of you uh, aren't aware of this. This is literally in the last three months or so, about three months ago, I added this and published this capability. Integration with a website called VirusTotal. VirusTotal is an online malware scanning service. It's basically, I call it antivirus as a service, or ass. <laughs> and if you go to VirusTotal, actually, we'll, we'll go to VirusTotal in a second. Let me show you the quick and cool way to go to VirusTotal when you're scanning a machine is to select columns, add VirusTotal. Here, where's VirusTotal? VirusTotal. And then go to Oops. Uh, it says I, here you get a tip that 
you need to enable it actually to see something in that column. So we're going to go enable it. And you say virustotal.com. And then you say check virustotal.com. What this does is if when you check it, it's Process Explorer is going to automatically send up the hashes of all the files that it sees for images as it as you're looking through the process list and the DLL list to virus total and then report the results of any previous scans there. And if the image has been scanned, it'll report its detection ratio against about 40 or 50 anti-malware engines that virus total runs automatically. If it hasn't been scanned yet, it's not never been seen, you'll see unknown. And if you see unknown but you want Process Explorer to submit an image, and we'll do that in a second, see it's hash submitted over here and let's drag this over. And in a few seconds this is going to populate with the virus total scanning results and there you can see it. And this is kind of interesting because there's a couple of antivirus engines that are flagging WinHost as malware even though it's, you know, it's my own little private thing. I've never released this out in the wild, so I don't know how they got a hold of it. But unless somebody from one of those antivirus companies came to one of my sessions and thought it'd be funny to add it. <laughs> but so here, McAfee, so I just clicked on that link. It's a hyperlink. It takes you to Virus Total and shows you the report. And you can see that this was uh, scanned uh, in October, seven months ago. The detection ratio is 248, which you saw on the list. And you can see the hacker and McAfee both say, think this thing is possibly suspicious. So those guys, I give them credit there for being correct that it is a suspicious executable. But that's a, a very easy way to, to look for malware is to, to automatically have it scanned. Now the, you'll notice that as we go through this that the virus total, you'll see some anti-malware, even really well-known anti-malware, or malware rather, only be detected by some of the antivirus engines out there. That is really what you're going to see is a graphical state of the world when it comes to how antivirus really is failing us at this point just because of the sheer volume of malware. And you can see that that's why it's instead of saying yes it's malware, you see the ratio here because these could be false positives. Like in this case, it's, it's really kind of a false positive. So you really need to go look at, take a look at the report and it's just another signal as to whether something's potentially malicious or not. And then finally, I've got a SIG check, which if this is what I recommend people do when they're scanning malware, uh, scanning a system is to run a tool called SIG check, which you can, uh, it's basically a file versioning tool. And for example, if I do uh, SIG check on WinHost, it'll tell me that it, it'll check the signature, it tells me it's unsigned, and it gives me that other information. But the way to look for malware is to do a dash E, which says look at all executables, a dash U, which says show me the stuff that's unsigned, and dash VR, and then say dash S to do a, a, a recursive search. Let me zoom in here. Dash S to do a recursive search, and then star, or C star, C colon, colon backslash, and that'll scan everything under the C drive that's an executable, checking virus total with the hashes and then opening the browser for anything that reports a non-zero detection. If I do that on this directory, sigcheck-u-e-vr star, it's actually going to find, it will find two executables and open me the reports for them. And one of them here is WinHost that we just saw, and the other one is this one, which is uh, identified here as temp 1c3.temp, but it, the file name uh, here on my system is undexed.exe. So, and this is uh, signed and it's from, uh, it looks like a hardware driver, although one piece of, of uh, one antivirus engine, Rising, I've never heard of that, thinks that it might be a dropper. So, so I don't know, maybe I'm infected with a dropper at this point, uh, but we'll clean that off later. Next is strings. Another signal is to look at what the image, uh, strings are inside the image. And let's take a quick look at what strings are inside of, of this WinHost. By going to the strings tab, the thing about the strings tab is that it shows you the, by default, the strings that are in the image on disk. And if for a packed image like this, that might be garbage because it's compressed or encrypted. 
So there's this check radio button down here called memory. And then what you should do is look for things like suspicious URLs in the image. And then that's another strong signal that this thing is malicious. And then there's this command line version of string of that capability in a tool called strings also from sys internals. Finally, the last thing we'll take a look at is the DLL view. And this you pop open with the control D switch. This will also do automated verified signature checks and virus total checks. Here. Across all the DLLs. And uh, so this is a, another quick, uh, easy way to look at inside of a, a hosting image to see what DLLs it's hosting if you think that the host might be suspicious. The same kind of information you see there. And the same strings capability here on the DLL properties that you saw in the process tab. Now we've identified some malicious, suspicious process. Let's get rid of them. Don't just terminate them, though. Why not? Because that's cruel and inhumane. So what you should do is put them to sleep. So then kill them. And then they don't know what's happening. <laughs> now the reason that I actually have that advice, and it's real advice to do that, is there's lots of malware out there that has the buddy system, including my fake malware right here. If I delete this guy, you'll see it pops right back to life down here with a buddy, because its buddy is watching it. So you can either try to race against the buddy system, which is kind of challenging, and delete both of them before they uh, respond each other, which is really fun way to spend a few hours. Or, or you can just suspend them like this by right-clicking and say suspend, and now they show up dark gray, and now you can terminate them. And now they're out of the way. So we've cleaned the malware, the processes off the system. Let's take a look at how these things got started. And for that, we're going to turn to MS Config, right? Anybody use MS Config? Nobody? Oh, good. You're learning not to. Oh, no, no, you're not learning not to raise your hand. <laughs> now, the reason that uh, you don't use MS Config. Well, actually, MS Config, I have to, I have to give uh, MS Config, uh, the uh, guys in Windows, a lot of credit because MS Config, in, in the process of reimagining Windows 8, they reimagined MS Config as well. And so it's, it's really quite reimagined here. <laughs> so if you go to Task Manager, we're not going to bother going to Task Manager because it really doesn't know ab about all of the locations that malware can hide. If we went to Task Manager right now, it wouldn't even know how WinHost got launched, just to give you an example. So the tool we're going to turn to is Auto Runs. How many people have used Auto Runs? Raise your hands. So quite a few of you. Let's take a look at a quick look at Auto Runs scanning my system. And I launch it, and what it's going to do is pop up here in a second and scan hundreds of locations, literally hundreds of locations where stuff can get started automatically when you boot, when you log in, when you run a program, driver services, scheduled tasks, we, uh, codecs, security providers, boot execute image hijacks, just the list goes on and on, and you can see that there's just an incredible amount of stuff that just on a, on a clean system like this gets launched. This is overwhelming, so what I recommend you do, and actually this hasn't finished scanning yet because it's hitting some MSIT stuff that's on the corporate network that I'm not connected to, so that's going to time out here in a second. But what I recommend you do is when this is finished, let me just cancel it, it's, is go to the options and tell Auto Runs to only show you unsigned or uns uh, images that are not signed by Microsoft. And that way you can find all the third party things on your system, as well as the unsigned things that could be malware. And that, some of these days, some of the malware can be even signed. This is taking a while to, to cancel, so. We'll come back to that in a second. What you can see here is auto start entry point, so where the thing is registered. You can see the things that are inside it, process, uh, sorry, image name, description, company name, just like you see in, in Process Explorer, as well as the path to the executable. If I scroll down here, and actually I think this is holding up 
We're not going to see WinHost in here. Actually, let me take a look. WinHost. Yeah, it's not scanned for WinHost yet. Because this uh, MSIT thing is holding me up. We'll come back to that and I'll show you how it identifies WinHost. But I want to say that there's a couple new things here in Auto Runs. One of them is this right here, the WMI tab. This uh, is in the release that I posted earlier this week because malware now is starting to use WMI to put auto starts into it. So now if you, there's something that's auto starting using WMI in the WMI database, you'll see it now show up here in process and so auto runs and you'll be able to disable it for those new types of malware. So this is just constantly evolving based on the hackers just finding new and new newer and newer kind of cool techniques to get themselves auto launching. Okay, this is done now, so let's go take a look and I'll find WinHost. Oh, it's not showing up. Oh, it's because I canceled the scan. All right, let me try this again. So I'm going to say uh, here, verify code signatures and hide everything and then rescan and hopefully this will go faster this time. And now this is just the unsigned stuff, third party things as well as unsigned things. And here's WinHost right there in Explorer pol Policies, Explorer Run. This is a place that Task Manager and MS Config don't know how to look. At this point, this is the way you get rid of it is just to uncheck it. Do not delete it because if it's something that's really legitimate, you might have just broken your system and you want to be able to fix it later. So always try to do the minimal damage. This also has the ability to search online to look at the properties and to even jump to the place in the system registry or the file system where this thing is registered to, uh, to launch. So you can go take a look at the original target location. Uh, Auto Runs also has the ability to scan offline systems. This is important if your system is so infected you can't clean it while the system is online. Boot into a Windows to go or boot into another image and then you can point auto runs at that target location and clean it. One other new feature here is the timestamp column. This is relatively new and what this will do is if you've got something that looks suspicious, look at the timestamp, look at when this, when, when I added WinHost to the system. When I registered as an auto start, it was literally, uh, it was back in January. So that, that's when I added it and that will tell you that, hey, this thing potentially is correlated with some other activity on the network and that's the purpose of that. So I've told you how to delete them. Refresh after you delete. So press F5 to see if the malware has come back. And the reason why you want to press F5 is that, like I said, malware has self-defense mechanisms and it will put itself back. The way that you can figure out who's putting it back if it does come back is using Process Explorer. So this is the tracing malware activity part which is, okay, I've gone through the first phases, the stuff keeps getting back, where is it coming from? Let's turn to Process Monitor. This can, this tool is so useful at finding all sorts of problems as you'll see in the case that I explained that Dave Solomon's come up with an expression, when in doubt run Process Monitor and every tech ed I try to get the audience, you guys to to take that home with you, if you're going to take home one thing from these sessions, is to take home when in doubt run process monitor. So I ask you to all say it together. And let's see how good we can get at this. Run two, three, when in doubt run process monitor. Wow, you're the best tech ed audience this year. It's uh, awesome. Let's take a look at what process monitor shows. So at time of day, process name, operation, path of the operation, result, and detailed status or detailed information about the particular operation. So you can see this is a, uh, a file open and you can see the open information like what type of open it is and what sharing mode it has and so lots of extra information about each operation. I'm going to compress the display by getting rid of the time of day because we're not going to be really referring to that. There's a bunch of different things that Process Explorer will show you in addition uh, to what's in the default display. 
All of the data collected for an event is shown on this tab right here. So you see some additional information like which thread. You can see the duration of the operation. And then here's the details that we saw in that detailed column. There's an overwhelming amount of information in this display. So filtering is the key to using Process Monitor effectively. And there's a number of different ways you can filter. Like you can right click and say I want to see everything that here, I want to only include that path right there. Or I want to exclude certain types of operations, like I don't want to see create files, so I can say exclude. I don't want to see anything before a particular timestamp, so exclude performance before. And then you can type control R, or you can go to the advanced filtering and edit the filters directly from there, including disabling them temporarily. So I could say, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Let me undo that, but I might want to put it back. So I just uncheck it, and that way I can toggle the filter on and off. The most powerful filter for hunting down malware's impact on a system is category is right. So category is right will show you only the changes being made to the system. And you can see that in just a normal operation, a lot of things are modifying registry keys and files. But when you target this at a particular process, which you can do, and here's another way to target at a particular process, is open the process tree view. Shows you the list of the, all the processes that have been running throughout the trace. And let's say that I want to see just a command prompt. And I want to see, so I say include subtree. I haven't done anything in this command prompt, but now when I go to the temp directory and I say echo hello test.txt, then that will show up because that's a modification of the system made by that process. So that's a, the tip on filtering. All right. We've finished the tutorial on the tools. Time to get to some real malware. What do you say? All right. Let's start with scareware. It's pretty scary stuff. Like this piece of scareware right here. Some of you have probably seen this before because I've shown it. This is also really annoying because they're using my name on this fake antivirus, Sys Internals. And so uh, I've sued them. <laughs> and then this is really annoying because <laughs> I had no idea there was another Mark Rusinovich. So I need to find this guy. Let's take a look at this piece of malware called FakePav. And FakePav, here's the, in the prevalence report, FakePav is this line right here. Wait, FakePav is right here. So FakePav, uh, you can see its prevalence went down, but it was really active back in 2012, still making its way around the internet. And for all of these pieces of malware, I've got links to them here. So this is fake path. Great information here in the Microsoft anti -mal and the Malware Center. So lots of detailed information about the way this thing works. You can see technical information. Yeah. It's just awesome source of information. Let's take a look at fake path. And I've got FakePav ready to go here. So I'm going to turn on this virtual machine and we're going to start FakePav. And FakePav, it's got the audacity to actually ask for admin rights, which my mom would probably give it. And then it pre presents itself as a Windows activity booster. And you can see that it turned off UAC. And so it's actually going to force the reboot to get that active. Now we're going to skip. But what this thing does is launch itself when the system reboots and does a scan of your system. And while it's scanning, it's going to, I wonder if it'll find anything on this system. So this is what it looks like. Um, it does have a bug, so I've reported this negative. <laughs> And that'll take uh, a minute because it really wants to make it look like it's doing something. So we're not going to wait for that. Let's go and see what the end result is. And I've had, of course, the two Sys Internals tools ready and monitoring what's going on there so we can see what this thing did. 
Uh, this is it's finished. It's found a whole bunch of crap on my system. Trojan downloaders, worms, root, a rootkit. It's found a rootkit. Uh, it's found a hoax. That's probably the blue screen screensaver which I have on there. And then if you try to exit it, it says you can allow unprotected settings, start, uh, start up in the settings, which is kind of nice of it. If I go to settings, it's got this nice scheduler so I can do scheduled fake scans if I want to. <laughs> and then I can, but I also can do this, allow unprotected startup. And if I do that, then it actually, well, gives me a warning, I'm doing a bad thing. And then, but I can then get to the desktop. All right, so, well, actually, I didn't have the system internals tools running. So the trick is, how do I clean this thing off the machine? So let's go try to run the system internals tools. And the first tool that I want to run is Zoomit. Everybody familiar with Zoomit? Yeah, that's what I've been using to zoom around. The, um, uh, why am I not connecting to the network? That's, I'm going, let me try this. Because we want to get to the network. Oh, that's because I'm not on the wireless. And there we go. So now, uh, actually, let me try getting on the show net instead so that my VMs work. And disconnect from the wire. And uh, come back here. Sorry about this. And wireless. All right, so let me try running Zoomit and, oh, I can't run Zoomit. Firewall, uh, the firewall has blocked it. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's, it's suspected to have infected my machine. And it's the type of virus that intercepts data and transmits it to a remote server. And uh, I didn't know the NSA had gotten onto my system that way. So how do I run Zoomit? Well, what I did when I ran across this piece of malware is I said, what, what does it try to block? Does it try to block Task Manager? Yeah, I just launched Task Manager, it didn't work. Does it try to block RegEdit? Yeah. Does it try to block Command Prompt? Yeah. So it's blocking a lot of stuff, but what about these things? Paint? Oh, look, I can run Paint. Huh. What if I rename Zoomit to Paint? Will that work? Oh, no, it's too smart. It still knows it's Zoomit. But what if, what if uh, I put that in a different directory? Like here, in the Windows directory. Oh, there we go. Zoomit. So that, there's a way to trick it by renaming stuff. Like, let's name this, well, maybe I can just copy this to the Windows directory. Process Explorer. Nope, doesn't like that, but what if I rename it? There we go. So we found a chink in its armor, and that's all we need. And we've submitted the hashes to virus total. We've got our, we're looking for our heuristics, and look at that, stands out like a glowing beacon in the night, packed, no description, no company name, virus total. By the way, look, 21 of 45. Oh, I can't launch IE. <laughs> so what I can do, though, is I can go and uh, do this. I can say, kill it. And then I, oh, now I can't get it. Oh. Uh, let me go to auto runs. Now I can run auto runs. And auto runs will also find it. And then what I'll be able to do is now I can run command prompt. And here's where the path is. And by the way, look at this. This thing is actually digitally signed. And the certificate has been, not been revoked. And the guy has his name in there, Dimitri. So he's pretty proud of his work. <laughs> Even though uh, I, saw, I found some flaws in it. And let's go find this thing, sig check. So I can do a sig check and go to virus total and sig check, see users, Abby, app data, roaming, guard FERP, um, and we want to do a VR. And that'll open up, and I'll say UI. 
and that will open up virus total and we'll see which anti malware doesn't know about this thing. So we see 21 and 45 and these are all the guys that don't know about this. That's just lame. Lameness. So that's the state of anti malware right there, right in front of you. Of course, Microsoft, we know what it is. So, so that's a, a look. Now, uh, cleaning this thing is as simple as going to auto runs and doing this. Actually, that's not a good way to clean it. Because this thing is taken over as the shell, which has a couple of implications. One is that if you boot into safe mode, this thing will still run. The only way to get this thing not to run is to boot into safe mode com with command prompt, which overrides the shell value and ra launches command.exe. But what you really want to do here is to jump to entry, and this is just a, a good thing to know in your malware cleaning toolbox, is that shell should be, and actually I've deleted the shell value. Let me put it back. By doing that, if I do jump to entry, shell should be explorer.exe as we saw earlier. And that fixes the machine. So now we can delete the file, we've cleaned the auto start, we've got our shell back, and this machine is now clean from this piece of uh, malware. Let's take a look at another one. Unwanted software. Actually, I'm going to skip this one and go to one that's more interesting so that we have some more time to spend on another case later. This one is my mom. My mom calls me and she says, Mark, what the, what the, oh, what the is on my computer? I'll try that again. What the is on my computer? I can't, this is my IE startup page. It's this browser thing, Artemis Portal. Even though I've got Bing as my startup page, as you told me to put it. <laughs> and then she's also getting this thing, this little toast every all the time that says that her system's not backed up, even though I've got her system backing up to the cloud too. So she says, uh, I need you to clean this stuff. So I remote into her system and I decided I'm going to go after the backup toast first. And what I did is I just launched Process Explorer. I used the Windows Finder to find where the backup toast was coming from. It's coming from this thing right here, my PC backup there. And then I launched auto runs. And here's, you can see this thing is digitally signed too. So this is what we call unwanted software. I'll talk about that in a second. And so then I disabled that. So that had cleaned the unwanted software, and then I uh, deleted the files off the disk. So that got rid of this My PC Backup thing. And then the next thing I had to go after was this hijack of the browser start page. I go to her internet options, and sure enough, she wasn't lying to me. She had Bing set there. So, but when I launched IE, I did get that same startup tab. So I'm like, how the hell is this thing still overriding this? When I, I looked at the process list in Explorer, I saw nothing there. There was nothing at auto runs. How is this thing hijacking the start page? So what I did was turn to auto runs. Uh, sorry, process explorer. Let's take a look at process explorer. Log file that I captured. So I captured a startup of IE. I went to the process tree. Here's IE's startup right there. And I took a look. And look at that. It starts up with this command line, which if you enter that, that looks familiar. That's what it is. So how's this getting there? So I'm like, how is this command line getting there when I don't see anything in the registry? I don't see any, re any reference to this command line in the, anywhere else in the process, monitor trace. Anybody know what the answer is? Shortcut. That's right. It was the IE shortcut. It had changed to have this as the command line. So I went to the shortcut, deleted it, and now she had her, her Bing back as she wanted. And that was, this, that was uh, 
that case solved, and of course now she's bragging to all her friends about how I cleaned her machine for her. Uh, she's really proud of that. First thing they, she tells people when they come over to the house, Mark cleaned my computer the other day. That's, and uh, they say, oh, can he clean my computer? <laughs> so let's talk about ransomware now. How many people have been hit by ransomware? Yeah? Ransomware has gotten really, really bad. And uh, let me show you some pictures of ransomware I've, got, I've collected. Show you all the different flavors it comes in. And all the kinds of things it does to try to do to scare you into paying these guys money. Here's one technique. It's you've got porn, child porn on your machine. And we're the police. And you know what? We'll forgive you if you pay us. And uh, the, the interesting thing about that, even if somebody real thinks, knows that this is suspicious or fraudulent, then they're like, I wonder, what if some, like, what if back, bad guys really did put child porn on my machine? So if I go to the authorities, I'll get in trouble. Um, what, what's kind of interesting is that some, there was uh, this story back in Jan January of this year that made the news. A guy walked into Best Buy with his computer and said, look, I've got malware, ransomware that's telling me that I've got child porn on my machine. And the, uh, the Best Buy guys took a look at his machine and he did have child porn on his machine. It was his child porn. And then they called the police and arrested him. So that's not really smart. Here's one that's the German police. I don't understand, or some police that speaks German. And they're telling you, attention, something, pay us money. And then this is, a, this is the Russian approach to it, which is buy something and not. <laughs> and then here's another Russian one. And uh, here's the FBI one. The FBI does a lot of money pack dealing. <laughs> and then here's another one. Uh, this is, this, uh, if you've got a webcam on, they turn on the webcam and then look at you. And, they're, and then so you're like, oh, take a picture of you using the webcam. And then you're like, oh my god, they've got my picture, too. <laughs> so we're back to the beginning. This, I was told this as I was wandering in the audience. I didn't see this. This scourge has gotten so bad. This is the headlines from USA Today, today, this morning. The front page. Did anybody see this? Hackers holding computers hostage. This is the front page of USA Today. So this is, a, I think, a timely... So. When I saw that, when, when he told me that, I said, oh, I better add a ransomware section to the talk. So I did, right before we started, to make it really timely. I'm just kidding. I had it there already. <laughs> so here's one. Let's take a look at ransom.fs. I'm going to go to uh, ransom.fs here and show you the first one. So ransom.fs, the first thing it does Oops, I need to enable this. Let me revert that. Hold on. I made the mistake of not getting process monitor ready. So lock screen. And this is going to take over the, this desktop. I've got a tool, a system internal tool called desktop, so we can go to a, a secondary desktop and still interact with the tools. So we can look behind the scenes at what this thing has done. And this will launch in a second. Well, it'll launch in a second. That's why I've got this ready. What it's doing is contacting the web to reactivate itself at this point. So I'm going to jump ahead to the checkpoint I got with it already launched. And there it is. It's another one of those German guys. And if I come over here, I've captured a trace with process monitor of, of uh, process uh, categories right. Let's stop that. Let's open Process Explorer. We've got virus total going on. And look, another bright, shining light. This is a uh, piece of malware. It's lo uh, well, it would have a fake name if it really came down here. But it advertises itself as heavy mud gem is the description. I don't know what that means. And, but it's from NEC computer, NEC computers, which I didn't know they were still in business. And then, I'm just kidding. That's, that 
Sorry, no offense. <laughs> Anybody work for NEC? Any, any C in here? Anybody? Okay, so maybe I wasn't kidding. No, I'm just kidding. Um, then we can, uh, we can't launch, ah, oh, crap, I did that again. We can't la launch uh, IE because IE would try to launch over here and we can't see it on that secondary desktop. So what I've just done is hung uh, uh, process explorer while it's trying to launch IE. So let me just revert that real quick and come back. And uh, let's do this again. Turn off the trace. And this would actually, this, if we uh, launched, we'd see there's still four pieces of uh, anti malware that don't know about this thing. If we s click on this thing and we go to strings and we go to memory, one of the things I always do is just see if they've got any HTTPs in there. And sure enough, they do. There's an HTTP sitting in here. And this HTTP, if we go to that, is some website, uh, some site. If you enter it in an IP tracker, it's some, I think it's in Germany. It's uh, some place that's been hijacked probably, and it looks like it's still active. But this is a w example of how the strings will show you what's going on inside of the executable. The other thing that we see on Process Explorer, which I didn't highlight earlier, well, let me do this, auto runs, is here, you should see the auto start location, win log on shell, very popular technique. So the exact same thing we do here to disable this thing is to right click jump to entry, but before we do that, we've got to terminate this thing. Um, and we actually, IE uh, browse, this explorer has been suspended by this thing as well as part of it, so let's restart explorer. And uh, now this will work. Oh, maybe not. Here we go. No, that didn't work. Anyway, you get the picture. Uh, that's still hung. What I need to do is terminate that piece of malware and then IE would launch. So that's a quick look at, at this ransomware. Now the next piece of ransomware that I'm going to show you is one of the most notorious pieces of ransomware out there. Somebody was talking to me today as I was walking around. CryptoLocker, also known as CryLocker, is a piece of ran a malware that, a ransomware that doesn't just lock the screen like the ones we've seen. It encrypts the files on your disk, and it does so not just using any old made-up crypto stuff, which is really insecure. It uses the proper SDL endorsed technique of using the Microsoft crypto libraries. So this is the right way to write crypto malware, if you're going to do it, is to use the crypto libraries, not make up your own ant, uh, mal, uh, crypto engine. So let's go launch and see how CryptoLocker looks in action. This is uh, snap, these are snapshots from a while ago. CryptoLocker is stealthy and they move around. They move their beaconing servers that they talk to. They use the Tor network. So this, this sample only, you know, you get a fresh sample, it works for a week or two and then, then it won't stop, it'll stop working because the beaconing locations that it is uh, designed to to go to, I have changed. So I've just launched this thing and this, it's not going to do anything because it's actually going and talking to the beaconing server. The beaconing server is not responding. So this is dead in the water at this point. Fortunately, I've captured screenshots of this thing already active or captured in, uh, checkpoints of this thing already active. So if I go back and take a look and then this is what it comes up and tells you. That you have a certain time uh, amount of time to pay up or it's actually going to delete your key. So what it does is uses a private public key, the private keys up in their servers, the public keys, what's been used to encrypt the files, and you need to upload information to that server so that it will hand, with, it'll verify that you've paid and then hand back the private key to decrypt the files on disk. And if you don't do that within a certain amount of time, they basically say we're not going to guarantee that we have your private key anymore and so your files might be unrecoverable. So this is, a, and they actually make true on that promise and that threat is that the files are really unrecoverable at that point. So this is more serious than the, the other ones that I've talked about. Let's take a look at what this thing does underneath the hood. 
and let's take a look at what Process Explorer shows. So first thing is that you can see that, take a look at uh, IE to see how many pieces, how many uh, Animower engines recognize this particular variant. 41 of 53, and I'm sure Microsoft is, oh, is one, uh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> what's the ironic about this is this sample was given to me by the Microsoft anti-malware team. So maybe they just haven't gotten around to adding it yet or they forgot about it. But uh, I'll make sure to let them know. You can see this thing also ad advertises itself as the description as Microsoft Windows Auto Update, but it has no company name. Of course, it's going to be unsigned if, if we do no signature was present. So this shows up with many of the characteristics. And if we look at what it's done under the, the hood, let's take a look at my pictures folder. So I put some pictures, sample pictures in here to try to lure it into doing what it does. And this is now what, how the pictures folders look. Normally we'd see icons here. I made a backup. This is what we should see there. But this is what we see now. Can't open because the photo viewer doesn't support this file, style of format. These files have been encrypted and if we search for through this, and I've got category is right enabled here. We're going to see it doing stuff to those pictures. Let me set a filter here and I'll do a look at that process tree. So you can look at a filter for the process or its child processes as well. And you can see here it's writing to a file, chrysanthemum jpeg.temp. And what it's going to do is this is the encrypted version of the file and then it's going to rename the original version and also put some information. So here it's going to rename to, uh, well, it started on desert.jpg here. So you can see the rename here for desert. But it also, before it starts encrypting, it sets the value to record what key it's going to be encrypting with. So here's the crypto locker registry key that it creates. So this way when the private key comes down, it knows which keys it's going to, which it used to uh, encrypt information. So you can see here is the, its public RSA key right there that it knows how to talk to the server with. So we can see all of that information here in the process monitor trace. Cleaning this piece of malware off the machine is as simple as going into auto runs, saying F5, and then doing this. And you can see it's put itself into two places, into run and run once. And we can delete it like that. But you know what? We're still screwed because our files are encrypted. So that's the sad thing about this one. It's really, yeah, you can clean it, but unless you've got a backup of your files, you're still out of luck. So this is a, a strong lesson in backing up your files so that you can get back to a, clean, a, a good system. Now let's talk about a corporate infection. This uh, we see, I see more and more of is, is people sending me cases where they're, they've gotten infected on their corporate network. And this is an interesting case because this is another zero-day piece of malware that hit a company. And the comp this started with uh, symptoms. The company was... Uh, seeing signs of malware throughout their network, what they would see is emails being sent to various employees' contact lists, blast emails, spam. They would see pop-ups on desktops. And they correlated this to everybody that in, came across this had a, was working on an Excel file called holiday.xls. So they looked, all, all these employees that are exhibiting these characteristics, they're all working on this holiday.xls file, I guess, where they're planning their holidays together or something. And so they did antivirus, extra antivirus, full scans on these uh, people's systems, didn't find anything, completely clean. So they contacted Microsoft support, Microsoft support came in and looked in the Excel startup directory. So this is Excel start. By default, Excel will launch any files or open any files that are in this directory. And the file that they saw there was this file called 4.xls. Question wa was, okay, what's that file doing there? They asked the company. This is not a legitimate Excel file, so they deleted it. A few minutes later, the file comes back. So at that point, they turned to Process Monitor to capture a trace 
of the startup. And let's go take a look at that trace right now. And if you can see in the process tree, this shows you an inner look at the way that processes behave. You see Excel spawning a command prompt, which spawns this attrib command, as well as two other command prompts. And the parameters of those command prompts are all related to that k4.xls. So this thing is creating the thing, hiding the thing, deleting the thing, recreating it. So it's using this file as an infection propagation vector. And you can see here it's even putting it in another place as well. So just a few minutes of process monitor, whoops, process monitor watching the startup of that thing was enough to let them know what's going on. Now, the question was, how is that thing getting launched from Excel? So they looked at the stack for the original launch of that command prompt. So we can do this, go to event, and that will take us to the ver first event in the list. And if we go up, this is the Excel line, the process create for that command prompt. Let's take a look at the stack. What the stack does is shows us the functions that were invoked to that operation, starting in reverse order. So at the very bottom, Excel started its life and then called up into here to actually create that file or to create the launch of that process. In the middle, we see VBE7.dll. So the question was, is this a malicious thing? And it's not. It's the Visual Basic Design Runtime Environment. So this thing is a VBS macro virus sitting in Excel that is creating this Excel spreadsheet to propagate itself. And that's what they were able to determine using this stack trace. So they submitted the holiday.xls file, which is obviously the, the infected root file, to the anti-malware team. And now that they looked at it, they did analyze it, and now this thing has been classified as a piece of malware by the anti Microsoft anti-malware engine. So other people that run across this particular malware will get it automatically clean. It's the mailcab.a virus. So few. The bottom line there is process monitor, just a few minutes there, pointed right at the root cause of this thing as this, thi this 4XLS file is actually the root cause and it's being generated by VBS macrovirus that came out of that original holiday.xls file. So confirming the suspicions of the IT pro department. The last case I'm going to show you is one that's really kind of, I, th I have to give kudos to the author of this particular piece of malware because it launches in a very clever way. It gains Rather, I, I'd say it gains admin rights on your, its machine, on the machine in a very clever way. This piece of malware is called Seraphif. Oh, and by the way, I've got to share this. Some of you have seen this before, but it's just such a classic quote. This is for all of the, the <laughs> give a man a stolen credit card and he'll eat like a king for a day, teach a man to fish, and he'll be set for life. And of course, that's from Nigeria. So the Seraphif uh, virus, you can see that this thing is also quite popular here. This is the red line here from the last threat intelligence report from Microsoft. This thing, let's get that launched, uses a technique to hijack a launch of a legitimate process asking for admin rights to get admin access to your machine. So I've got process monitor here ready to go. I'm going to turn on tracing so we can see how it's doing it. And then I'm going to launch Seraphif. So in a second here, I'm going to get a UAC prompt. And what is that UAC prompt? All right, no, that's not a piece of malware. That's legitimate software as much as uh, it enables malware. This is the Adobe Flash Player, and if I say yes, it's, you saw that it had the blue thing that said it's digitally signed, so that is the legitimate Adobe signature on that thing. It's the real Flash installer, the out-of-the-box generic Flash installer. I don't need to go through the rest of this because this thing is already activated, it's already gained admin rights, and it's already set itself as an auto start on my system. How did it do that? Let's go back to 
process explorer or our process monitor. And let's take a look at at what happened. And we've got categories right on, so I can go to the process tree, and you can see Serifif here launching install Fast Player. And then that install that and these are both from Adobe, say that they're from Adobe Flash, and if we went and took a look at the digital signatures on them and checked virus total on them, these are the legitimate binaries. So something Serifif is doing is influencing the behavior of install Flash Player when it gets admin rights to execute the malware. How is it doing that? It's not via the command lines, because these command lines are generic. They have no parameters, except for this IV6, which is innocuous. So how is this thing getting itself injected into Adobe? Let's say include process, and now we're gonna, just going to look at what Serifif did to the machine. Say close. And we're going to go up to the top. It's actually, this is the full trace of all the things that it did to the machine. And so it did some things. And by the way, this piece of malware only installs itself. It's really aimed at corporate networks. It only installs itself if you've got the Google Enterprise Chrome client installed. So there's a Google Chrome Enterprise version that you install on, on corporate networks. And that's installed on this machine. If I didn't have that installed, this malware would not activate. So it's hijacking. It's trying to make itself look like the Google Up Chrome Enterprise updater, as you'll see. And so the first things we can see it do here is drop itself into interestingly named file directories. And those file directories are local Google desktop, which is a limited directory install, some GUID, uh, GUID and then some funny character paths. This is using Unicode characters to fool most utilities that parse paths to not be able to get into that directory where this thing is sitting. We're going to go in there anyway and get around it. And then you can see it's setting itself as a run in the Google update key. And then it's also dropping this file right here, msimage32.dll. What is msimage32.dll? There's a legitimate one right there. This is the real MS image. MS image 32.dll. And you can see that this is the GDI extension client DLL. Why is it dropping this? It, let's reset the filter and then see who reads this. So I'm going to just do include on that, and now scroll over, and there it is. Install Flash, which is the Adobe installer, is reading this file. Why is it reading that file? Because the DLL load for that particular DLL through the DLL loading goes to the current directory before it searches the path. So it start, launches install. Uh, this is Adobe installer with the current directory set to pl place where it dropped this malicious version of that DLL so that the Adobe installer goes to load it, loads the malicious version, the malicious version activates, and it's, a hi it's basically hijacked that MS image. Let's go take a look if it's there, still there. Let's see users, app, abby, app data, local, temp, and it's gone. It's deleted, so we can't get at it. But what it will do is now activate itself, but then also have the legitimate MS Image 32 code in it so that the installer continues to function as normal. But now the thing was just given admin rights, loaded into the Adobe Acrobat, uh, sorry, the Flash Player installer. If I do an F5 now, you can see the legitimate Google updater here which shows up as verified, and then you can see two instances of the auto start for this fake thing here in the run key, Google update, and this is actually Russian that's not showing up right, and then in services as well, so it installs itself twice just in case you find one and you miss the other. And where is it sticking itself? Is in that weird funky directory. So if I do copy and I do CD to that directory, 
Well, actually, let's do this. I'm going to do Notepad. And uh, let's try. And then you can see the Russian in here, by the way. And you can see that I'm pressing forward, but the characters, the, the selection's going backwards because it's using funny um, Unicode stuff to go left to right, right to left, rather. Let me instead do this. I'll go and copy it from here. Oh, that's not where I wanted. Where's the Google update thing? So I want to do uh, Seraphif. And we're just going to go in that directory real quick. So I'm going to say add to include filter. And then oh, search for update. And here's the path. So I say copy. And then say CD paste. And we're in. And when I do dir, I don't see anything. But if I do dir slash a, oh, I don't see anything. Oh, I saw something earlier today, so I don't know why I'm not seeing it. Is that the right directory? OK, well, I guess every demo with malware is an interesting one. But I was able to get in there and see the files that it had dropped in there earlier. Oh, you know what? Uh, hmm, I wonder if I didn't let it run long enough through the installer to, or capture enough of the trace to see the ultimate location where it dropped itself. But if I do this, oh, the file is there. So what's going on here? Is that the same path? Uh, DD, yeah. Hmm. OK, well, I can't find it. But what, it what we'd find is that this thing would show up as, as malware. And this thing also, it reaches out to the net network. So if we um, look at network traces for this thing, so if I get rid of the categories right, we're going to see it hitting the network, which is going to prevent it from activating fully. Because this thing, you can see static reverse lookups here. If I do this and this, and then now we can see it looking up various places on the web. Uh, and here's the static softlayer.com. And I suspect that something in here is causing it not to, to activate. But in any case, what we've just seen is that auto runs both points at the auto start locations, and process monitor shows us exactly how it's configuring itself on the system. And process monitor is also showing us how it's active, uh, talking on the network. And so this is a way that you would be able to take a look at a machine see that it's potentially infected. Auto runs would show you what's going on. Process Explorer, again, would show you what's going on. But the, it, my point with showing you this is the clever techniques that hackers are using now more and more. I expected things to get this sophisticated a long time ago, and it's just only recently that we're starting to see these kinds of clever tricks for malware to gain admin rights on a system, for example. So that brings me to the conclusion of the talk. And I want to summarize just that these trends have been ongoing. You see people now saying antivirus is dead. You saw examples after example in this talk of pieces of malware that are well known by a certain number of anti-malware engines that are unknown by others, which just shows you that you're very likely to run across malware in the wild that's not known. And that's why these particular tools and techniques are essential if you want to keep abreast on, on your own to get an idea of what's going on with malware. Of course, if you run across something really sophisticated and these tools only take you so far, that's when you call in professional help. But at least at that point, you're paying good money for somebody to come in and really do a professional job if you can't get it done. In many cases, you can. Certainly with your family and friends' computers, you should be able to get the job done in most of the cases like I have done on my families and friends and, and mom systems. And I want to leave you with one last thing, and that is how many of you have read the book Zero Day? This is uh, the talk's officially over, so you're welcome to go if you'd like to. But 
Those of you that have read Zero Day, you know that I've been, uh, I've written several novels, Zero Day being the first, it's a cyber thriller. What I tried to do was make it interesting and address an audience like you guys, where you read it and don't go, oh, the aliens uh, infected the satellite with a piece of Mac malware. Uh, so I really tried to keep it authentic, and each one, ta each of the three novels that takes a, a look at a certain aspect of cybersecurity and the world, what's going on in the world. The first one, cyber terrorism. The second one, state-sponsored cyber espionage. And the third one, Rogue Code, is coming out officially on May 20th. And I've got a little video trailer that I'd like to show you here on my personal website. Jeff Eakin, ex-CIA, as head of counter-cyber terrorism. He predicted 9-11. He stopped cyber warfare from Al-Qaeda. But when he's asked to investigate vulnerabilities at the New York Stock Exchange, someone wants him stopped permanently. From the real-life cybersecurity expert Mark Rusinovich, the key to a world financial empire is the Rogue Code. So it took me forever to get my voice to sound like that, but, <laughs> but I'm doing a, the reason I point, point this out is this book is available to you ahead of the general public in the book tech at bookstore and I'm doing a book signing at noon so I'm going to run over there real quick so I apologize if I don't have really time to take questions here on the way out but I hope to see you at the bookstore and if not there then at the case then explain back in this room at one o'clock for my last session of the week and have a great lunch. Thanks.